the ancient faith for the modern world. This is Ancient Faith Radio. the Lowe's with your hosts, Father Nicholas and Dr. Roxanne Lowe, where we will connect our Orthodox faith to -to day-to-day living and relationships to our family, our work, and our view of ourselves. Father Nicholas is the priest at St. John the Divine Greek Orthodox Church in Jacksonville, and Dr. Roxanne is a licensed clinical psychologist who uses her extensive training in private practice. Questions are welcome by calling 855-237-2346. That's 855-237-2346. Here now is Father Nicholas and Dr. Roxanne. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Live with the Lowe's. My name is Father Nicholas Lowe, and Christ is risen. So happy that you're joining us tonight. I'm the parish priest at St. John the Divine Greek Orthodox Church right here in the great city of Jacksonville, Florida. And we're so excited that you're joining us on this May 3rd evening. If you're new to Live with the Lowe's, just so you know, it's a show that marries both faith and psychology to give you some practical steps to guide you in your walk of faith. We kind of merge faith and psychology and just give you some practical principles that you can apply in your everyday life. So we're so grateful again that you're joining us. Before we dive into tonight's really exciting and important topic, as always, I want to invite you all to join us on our social media platforms. If you're on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, uh, YouTube, please make it a point to join us. You can go, you can be part of our social media family by putting in that search engines for those specific platforms, the Lowe's, just simply L-O-U-H-S. It's the Lowe's. And we also want to let you guys know about our website. If you want to find out where we're speaking next or just information about Roxanne and myself, we encourage you to go there. It's also at thelows.com. And finally, if you're like us and you just need a little daily word of encouragement or inspiration, uh, last year, Roxanne and I began sending out these daily words of encouragement that go out to quite a few people now. It's built up over the last year. Um, if you're interested in just getting some encouragement or if you're already receiving them and you know someone that it might benefit, Go to our website at thelows.com and simply put forward slash subscribe. And all you have to do is simply put your email address. Um, There's no strings attached. We're not going to send you any other email other than a daily word of encouragement um, that is much like modeled after our show. So we hope that you'll take the time to do so. Tonight, I invite you to join the conversation. As you all know, um, much growth and knowledge is formed really in the conversation. So we want you to be part of it. So call us at one 855 237-2346. That's 1-855-237-2346. You can email us a question at ask at ancientfaith.com. That's ask at ancientfaith.com. And we are simultaneously broadcasting our show on both the Lowe's Facebook page as well as Ancient Faith's Facebook page. So if you're tuning in and listening to us through that medium, please feel free to share a question or a comment, um, and we'll definitely address it during our show. So on April 24th, the second largest church in the world, the Orthodox Church, celebrates Easter, or what we call Pascha, the new Passover. And so we thought that we would dedicate a show, tonight's show, about the resurrection, then and how it applies to all of us today. Uh, said simply, it's almost like taking the t- going from the tomb to today. And we thought of no other person to speak about the resurrection Uh, Then our very dear friend, Dr. Jeannie Constantino, she's a Bible scholar. You're probably very familiar with her if you're part of the ancient faith family, but let me tell you a little bit about her. Dr. Jeannie Constantino holds several degrees in theology, including a Master of Theology from Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology and Harvard Divinity School. She earned her PhD where she specialized in the apocalypse in the ancient church of the East. She's currently teaching at the University of San Diego, the Franciscan School of Theology, and at St. Athanasios and Cyril Coptic School of Theology. Dr. Jeannie has attracted an international following through her two long-running podcasts right here on Ancient Faith Radio. They're called Search the Scriptures and Search the Scriptures Live, both, again, that you can find right here at ancientfaith.com and at orthodoxbiblestudy.info. She's the author of a great book called Thinking Orthodox. In fact, we've had her on our show talking about this show, this book. It's called Thinking Orthodox, Understanding and Acquiring the Orthodox Christian Mind. 
but we're really excited about her more most recent book. It's called The Crucifixion of the King of Glory, The Amazing History and Profound Mystery of the Passion, which was recently released by Ancient Faith Publishing, a book that we're going to talk a little bit about this evening. But so excited, Dr. Jeannie, as always, to have you on our show. Thank you. Thank you, Father Nick. Christos Anesti. Aditos Anesti. Oh, curious. I, you have to know, too, everyone that you're tuning in, that Dr. Jeannie was one of my professors and someone that I just have a very dear place in my heart for, um, someone that I, I love. Or I love not only um, how she, her writing style, and how, um, but also her ability to make, uh, to use words in a very practical way that um, applies whatever parts of the scripture into our everyday life. You know, in the book of James, it says that not only should we read it, but we should live it. And I think, Dr. Jeannie, you do such a beautiful way in giving us the encouragement to live the scriptures. And so thank you for for all that you do for us. But I want to dive right into, uh, you know, you were supposed to be on our show a couple weeks, a couple months back, actually, in March. Um, mm-hmm. But as you know, there was um, a flood that the a- Ancient Faith Publishing um, Studios had were dealing with, and so that show was canceled. But the, we were talking about the crucifixion um, at that time, but I think it's also similar to talk about that, that there can't be a resurrection if we did not go through the crucifixion, and that many books have been written about both the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. Why did you think there was a need to write yet another book on the crucifixion of Christ? Yes, I was supposed to be on back in March, back when it was landed more appropriate for us to be talking about the crucifixion. We don't really want to talk about that right now, and mm-hmm. we're not going to. But yes, Father, um, I had given that a lot of thought. Um, it, I had been speaking about the crucifixion for many, many years, mm-hmm. and I was often invited during Lent to different parishes to talk about it. And I thought, you know, you know, do we really, maybe I should make this into a book, but I really wanted to bring together many different elements that I don't think are addressed. Usually most of the books on the crucifixion are really very kind of one-sided. They're either Mm -hmm. by Bible scholars and they're very analytical or they're they're very technical sometimes if they're a commentary, or they might be by a historian, and then there are books by lawyers about the trials of Christ, and then there are books by doctors about the medical aspects of the crucifixion. But I never read one by anybody mm-hmm. who had had experience in all these different and knowledge in all these different areas. And the only area I didn't have actual education in was medical, but I had Mm. a lot of practical experience in discussing wounds and causes of injury and death and Mm. things like this as a lawyer, because I did work as a lawyer for um, some years. And so I had a lot of experience reading medical records and explaining them in a very practical and sort of straightforward way that anyone could understand. And then when I was a Harvard student, I got, I wrote my thesis on uh, Roman trial procedures in the criminal trial mm. procedures in the first century in the provinces. So wow. this is also a very specialized area that even New Testament scholars don't have any expertise with. And you kind of have to be a lawyer to understand a different legal system. Mm-hmm. It's not enough. It's easy to just get a few facts here and there, but to really understand how the process works and the kinds of questions that would be asked and the the way the process would be handled You have to have an already existing legal framework. So because I already had this background in the Bible, in first century, what we call Second Temple Judaism, in, you know, in the law, in Roman law and procedure, and also Mm -hmm. um, in medical, in reading and studying and explaining medical records, I thought that I could do a a pretty good job bringing together all of these different elements and presenting Mm -hmm. it in a way that people can understand because you there's we have a lot of questions i don't know you probably had a lot of questions too mm-hmm. father we hear mm-hmm. these same gospel readings again and again and again mm-hmm. every year and i mm-hmm. always had questions that i really you know didn't know um didn't take the time to delve deeply to answer mm-hmm. and then a person like me who might have questions, why does this, Why did this happen, and why did that mm-hmm. happen, what does this mean? They don't even know where to go for right. answers, or they might find one book and it gives them one answer. And in order to answer some of these questions, which can be very complex, mm-hmm. historical questions, medical questions, legal questions about the trial of Christ, whether it's Roman law or Jewish law, you really have to have a certain expertise to know where to find that information. And then 
You have to be able to dig through these very scholarly articles that are very complex. And if you don't understand the jargon, you don't understand what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So to, basically, I wanted to bring together all of the different resources and present it for, to people in a way that they could understand and benefit from the best of all of these different opinions, not to mention the fathers of the church, of course, mm -hmm. their, their spiritual insights into the mm -hmm. crucifixion. So that's a very long answer to the question of why did I write yet another book about the crucifixion? But I do think that it was effective in that I don't think there's another book like that out there that d discusses it from all of these different aspects with a person, by a person who has real expertise in those areas. I think it's so fascinating too, Dr. Uh, Jeannie, that you have this, you know, Christ could have come at any time throughout yes. human history. And he came at a time, I mean, you know, now, you know, we have the electric chair, there's even, you know, yep. hanging, I mean, things that are obviously much, uh, I mean, it's nevertheless death, but, but yes. the process by which you, that death takes place, I, I mean, he came at such a brutal time in human history. Yes. Um, and I've yes. always found that so just another affirmation of just the love, the amazing yes. love that, that, that God has for us. Um, and, and maybe I, I love I, that you, yeah, I love that you mentioned that, Father, because mm. I was thinking about that same thing while I was working on the book, that for, for him to come during a time when this particular method of execution was mm -hmm. legal, and not only legal, but very common, mm -hmm. really speaks to the plan of God to choose to come at this time. Because today you could never put someone to death by that. It's it's right. much less painful, no matter how, even if you have a modern sort of, sort of method of execution that is obviously going to involve usually some kind of pain, nothing like the crucifixion. So yes, he came at that time and was willing to die in that manner at that particular point in history, when this was the method that was chosen to mm -hmm. routinely execute people. So yeah, I think it's an amazing testament to part of the plan of God and also the love of God, as you mentioned. Just kind of building a little bit on this, uh, Dr. Jeannie, I mean, if you're, when you're looking at um, the way that this book has been, by the way, if, you, if, we, if you're just joining us right now, we're speaking to Dr. Jeannie Constantino. Uh, she's written this extraordinary book um, called The Crucifixion of the King of Glory, the Amazing History and Profound Mystery of the Passion. You can find it right here on Ancient Faith Publishing. It's also on Amazon, but an, an, just an amazing book. But I just want to kind of build on this a little bit, um, Jeannie, and that is when you look at, you know, all that Christ um, went through, If is there, you know, when you're with the readers who have read the book um, and in your retreats when you speak around the country, I mean, when is there one fact or one thing that you think, I, I know there's so much, but I mean, if there's one particular fact that you're like, that ever, that people, huh. it's, it, it just, it moves people when they hear it, that maybe you could help um, and share with our wow. listeners. I think that'd be great. Mm -hmm. I know there's so much, uh, you know, but I just, I'd love to just hear something that you think that it's is really just really hard. moving. Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, it's very, boy, it's really hard to choose something. I think one of the things that I do that I don't get into a lot of detail. I do think it's important to discuss, at least on some level, what Christ endured on the cross, what it was like, what mm -hmm. the physical, um, the the physical process of crucifixion, and also something which I hadn't really spent much time thinking about. That was things like the crown of thorns and the pain that was involved in mm -hmm. the crown of thorns, because mm -hmm. we kind of understand that as a humiliation, but I don't think we really appreciate right. the extent of the pain that was involved mm -hmm. in the crown of thorns, and this has to do with the nerves that are in the scalp. So sometimes it's that, because I do think that we don't spend too much time thinking about that, especially as Orthodox Christians. We don't focus a lot on the suffering right, of Christ. Right, right, right. Um, so I think that that's very profound. Um, I don't know if it if that's one of the things that moves people. I think that for the um, in the terms of the book, what I present in the book, and by the way, there's so much detail in the book. It's I could never begin to cover all of that, even in mm. a whole day retreat. Some of the things that I brought out that I hadn't really spoken about before is the extent to which the prophecies were fulfilled and how amazing that was. Mm. The prophecies about the coming Messiah, the kinds of things that he would do, what he would be like, the, the even the, what, what John meant 
about by the piercing when St. John mm. emphasizes so much that the Lord was pierced and why he makes such a big deal about that. Mm. The connections between what um, the Jews kind of, many of the Jews anticipated and the foreshadowings from the Old Testament, the the sacrifice of Isaac, but it, the sacrifice of Isaac is just so much more powerful than we kind of get the general idea mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. God the Father was willing to sacrifice and did offer his son, and Abraham was willing to do that, but his son wasn't actually sacrificed. But there's so much more than that. It is the Jewish understanding of the role that Isaac played in the life of the Jewish people because mm. his willingness to be sacrificed. And this mm. is one of the most profound things for me. So for the Jews, the important person of the story is not Abraham, it's Isaac, mm. because he was willing to die. You see, he, he was much younger than his father, who was 90, mm -hmm. but over 100 years old by then. Mm -hmm. He was 100 when he was born. Now he's well over 100. So when he finds out, when Isaac finds out that he is going to be the sacrificial offering, he doesn't fight it. Right. He is willing to be offered as a mm. sacrifice. And this has a this is something which the Jewish people have spoken about and thought about for hundreds and hundreds of years. It has a lot of implications in Jewish history. And they also connect that event to the Passover. And the date that Jesus was crucified, the 14th day of Nisan, their month Nisan, was the mm -hmm. same exact date that they decided, that they determined that Isaac was offered as a sacrifice. So when you look at all of these wow. different details that all come together perfectly mm -hmm. in the person of Jesus Christ, you, it just blows your mind and you think, this is not an accident, okay? Right. This right. has to be fulfillment of prophecy. So I think that this is pretty moving for people also. I love it's, that you're sharing that. Yeah. I mean, it's you know, I know powerful. that it's it's so. I know that the book is being well received, and uh, you know, obviously, the, the follow up question would be: is if you've written a, a book on uh, now on the crucifixion, you know, <laughs> is there a contemplation about writing a book on the resurrection of Christ? I think we have to, right? We mm -hmm. can never stop with the crucifixion. So, I may do that in the next year. I'm hoping to do something very similar from a historical perspective. I think that one of the things that I accomplished in that book is try to make people feel like they're really there and that mm -hmm. they can understand what's happening. In other words, it's not just factual. It has to be something that engages you. You have to, I, I try to get into the heads of people uh, like mm. Judas. Why did Judas take the money back to the temple? Why did he throw it in the temple? There's a reason for that. You know, all of the things that happened, why did the chief priests and you know, the Pharisees, why do they dislike Jesus so much? We we really need to understand this. Mm -hmm. What is that? Why does Jesus pose a threat to them? These men mm -hmm. were very powerful. What is it about? Why does he cleanse the temple? What's that about? Everything has meaning. And I feel like we need to immerse ourselves more into the culture and the history and understand why people behaved in the way that they did. Otherwise, they just seem to be people who are irrational and, you know, th there's mm -hmm. no sense to it, but we really need to understand that. So I'm hoping f to do the same thing, yes, for the resurrection, to understand it from a historical perspective as, as much know, as... And you know better than all of us. I mean, I think that um, the fact that the, the scriptures, the, the evangelists spend so much time, especially John, on... Mm -hmm. Holy Week and the and yes. the events afterwards. I mean, there, there's so much, so many chapters that consume the the book. That I love the fact that that's one of the things I love about the book is that you kind of give us that flavor of of leading up to this. It's not just you know, um, it, it gives an opportunity for the reader to kind of be there and and connect. Some, yeah. Yes, exactly. I th I think so. And and frankly, Father, that's one of the things. It, you know, when I was, I always felt like when I was when I was younger. Um, and I was thinking, what was I going to do with my life, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about how I really wanted to be able to teach, you know, the Bible or teach about religious, mm -hmm. about, about the faith. And um, again and again, in my Bible studies, people would say, you make it feel like we're there. Mm -hmm. And I, I would try to bring out those historical elements because we're so far removed from the culture, we just don't understand it. 
Mm-hmm. And just like if 2,000 years from now somebody writes about what's going on in Florida, you mm-hmm. know, in the year 2022, they're going to have a very difficult time understanding the culture of the United States in the state of Florida where you mm-hmm. live or in mm-hmm. the state of California. And so it's very foreign. So we're, t- we're 2,000 years away from this period of time in history, and we need help to Absolutely. understand it. And so when we understand it, it just becomes so much more meaningful mm. and so much more real. And it it shows how the Gospels really are accurately describing what happened. Because again and again, we hear people say, oh, this is not what really happened. They're just making it up. Pilate mm-hmm. was really brutal. So the Gospel writers are trying to make it look like they're trying to shift the blame for Jesus' mm. death to the Jews, and, and really Pilate wouldn't have given a second thought to crucifying Jesus. This mm. kind of thing we hear again and again, which undermines the credibility of the Gospels. So one of the things that I, I think I spent a lot of time on was explaining exactly what happened with Pilate, mm-hmm. because the, all of the Gospels are consistent that Pilate was very reluctant to crucify Jesus. And today, mm-hmm. a lot of Bible scholars don't accept that. They don't mm-hmm. believe that. Because we do have other writings that talk about Pilate, and we know that he was a pretty brutal guy, and he was a very, very mm-hmm. tough on crime. He had to be, to mm-hmm. be the governor of a province like Judea. But does this mean that the, what the gospel said is incorrect? Mm. Why it, d- why might Pilate have been reluctant to execute Jesus? So step by step by step, I go through this, and I explain it, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And and so Absolutely. I, I think that it proves <clears throat> really the truthfulness of the gospel accounts. So before we listen to other people talk about how they know better than the people who were actually there— Mm-hmm. and give us the first-hand uh, historical accounts, mm-hmm. we should really consider, um, uh, we should take seriously what the evangelists uh, are presenting us. And remember that they cared about the truth. I right. find it amazing that people say, well, they just lied, they just made it up. I think these are Christians. They, First of all, they're writing to people in the first century, they would know if they were telling the truth or not. Right, right. I right. mean, this idea that they're not writing for us 2,000 years ago, they'll never find out that I was lying mm-hmm. when they're reading this 2,000 years. No, they're not writing for us. They're writing for people who were alive. Many mm-hmm. people were still alive and remembered Jesus, or their parents had heard this or seen this, or they were witnesses. There were so many living witnesses to these events. The idea that somebody would just invent, totally fabricate, stories Mm. or say that Pilate was reluctant to crucify Jesus when really he wasn't, why would they do that? Mm -hmm. It's, it's, not just talking about their character, but it's presenting them as if as if they don't care about the truth. Right, right. And they cared more about it than we do mm-hmm. because they devoted their whole lives to this. They followed Jesus Christ. Are they following a lie? You, mm-hmm. you know, so the, of all of the so-called rational explanations that people give for these things that seem to make sense to us actually make no sense if you just scratch the surface, if you know the tiniest degree of history, you can Mm -hmm. see why that's wrong. But because Mm -hmm. we're ignorant about these things, we just, it sounds logical. Yeah, I guess they wanted to blame the Jews. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So people just accept these ridiculous arguments, you know. And and I think that's that's one of the great things about your book, is that you at least allow us to educate ourselves. I think for so, for so many people within the, within faith, and I think we, we all at some point uh, struggle with this is that we just simply believe whatever we've been told as opposed to kind of really researching it yes. and studying it and you do such a great job in doing that you're, you're listening to live with the lows we are speaking with our dear friend dr Jeannie constantino um uh, one of the topics that we're talking about is her book her brand new book called the crucifixion of the king of glory the amazing history and profound mystery of the passion you can find it right here at ancientfaith.com we invite you to join the conversation we'd love to hear from you uh, you can call in at one 235 2346. That's 1 855 237 2346. You can also email us a question at ask at ancientfaith.com. That's ask at ancientfaith.com. We have quite a few that are that, of you that are tuning in and, and on our social media platforms. So if you're on Facebook and you're wanting to tune into our show, you can 
go to um, simply the Lowe's, and that's our Facebook page, and we encourage you to share your comments there. Dr. Jeannie, you know, uh, people raise doubts about the resurrection of Christ mm -hmm. all the time. Oh, I know we were just kind of t speaking a little bit about this, but how important do you think it is not only for Orthodox Christians, but really for Christians in general to be able to respond to those arguments against the resurrection or other historical de details in the Gospels, for example? Well, I think it's very important, very, very important, because we have to be able to respond. When we don't respond, people simply accept that false narrative, that these things are not true and they couldn't have happened and they didn't happen. So mm -hmm. it's w one of the things I did early on in the book, in the, in the introduction, is I explain from an unbiased historical perspective mm -hmm. why the Gospels are trustworthy accounts, historical accounts. You see, even though, and I have to say, I'm very dismayed by the fact that Bible scholars are among the worst of mm. all people when it comes to believing and accepting the Gospels as historically accurate. And it's it's very shameful, but it's the truth, okay? A mm -hmm. lot of Bible scholars, of not Orthodox ones that I know of, but Protestants and Catholics, many of them, don't believe the truthfulness of the Gospels, that G even some of the miracles of Christ, you know, a lot of things. And it's just amazing to me. I don't know why they've chosen this field, but they don't believe it, okay? Mm -hmm. And they think that they're very intelligent and they're more being more objective and more scientific by questioning and questioning and questioning and saying this didn't happen and that didn't happen and Pilate, you know, Jesus didn't say this from the cross and this didn't happen on the cross and Pilate wasn't reluctant and all of these things were fabricated. So... It's very unfortunate because when you have Bible scholars saying that, of course, right. what is the general public going to think? Mm -hmm. So, But when outside of this little group of people who want to present themselves as, as very intelligent and critical and, and you know, progressive and, and they're, they're smarter than the rest of us, when you get out of that little group and you look at actual historians, ancient historians, people who study Roman Empire or other ancient you know, uh, um, civilizations, they consider the Gospels to be highly trustworthy mm -hmm. as historical documents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I mentioned is I give the criteria for why, that because they're used, they have to analyze historical documents all the time, Roman documents and Greek documents and writings of different types, and they are used to evaluating whether or not they are credible, okay? And so... I, this is the first thing I do is I talk about why the Gospels are credible. And one person said to me, you don't need to do that. The people who are reading your book already believe that the Bible is cred credible. Of, of course, I know that, but I'm trying to educate our readers to be able to respond to people mm. who say you can't trust the Gospels. I hope people will take that introductory chapter and sit down and spend some time studying it and memorizing it. Here is what historians say. The, this is why the Gospels are credible. Number one, we have four different accounts written mm -hmm. by four people in four different places, and they are consistent. Okay, we have four accounts that say Pilate was reluctant to crucify Jesus. For example, four different people. They're mm -hmm. not, there's no collusion. It's not like you have one account and you have to rely on one person. You have four different people. Mm -hmm. If you were to put a person on trial and you have four different witnesses who testify to the same thing, this is very strong evidence. But nobody takes that into consideration. We have four different accounts. They are from the first generation. These, the Gospels were written during the lifetimes of people who actually knew Jesus exactly. and experienced these events. This right. is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Very, very rarely do we ever have that in history, where we have four separate accounts by people, and these things were written during the lifetimes. And, and the reason why this is important is that historians will say that, that um, there is much less likelihood of any kind of exaggeration or falsification during this early period, during the period when there are living witnesses, because the person who's writing the account, the mm -hmm. gospel writers, know that there are living witnesses right. and they care about their own reputation. They're not going right. to write something that's false and then have people say, well, they falsified it because people are going to know if it's true. 
-hmm. Okay. So this is a very, very important factor. And you can really tell the difference between the Gospels and books that were written, say, 100 years later or 150 books that we call Apocrypha, not the Old Testament books. Mm -hmm. The Protestants call Apocrypha, but the ones like the Proto-Evangelium of James and other books that are not Scripture, how exaggerated they are. Mm. You know, when you read those books, they don't sound like the Gospels because they're highly exaggerated, highly emotional, and the Gospels are very straightforward and historical. And for this, our listeners, and, uh, Dr. Jeannie, I'm so sorry, just for our listeners, explain what those what those books that you're referring to were— you, you know why we're, the why we're they're looking, okay yeah, we're uh, looking at something like the proto evangelium of james mm -hmm. which if you read it you see how it's extremely exaggerated the way people speak mm -hmm. um it's highly emotional it's very fanciful other there's other apocrypha like about the childhood of jesus these are false writings okay right, writings that right. they're not really by apostles they people just signed the names of the apostles where jesus goes around nazareth as a little kid doing miracles and things like this those books were not written during the lifetime of anybody who knew Jesus. Those books were written 100 or 150 years later. So, so if you read those, they have a completely different feel to them than the canonical Gospels, which are very straightforward, very historical. They, they just call Jesus, Jesus. They don't call him our Lord Jesus Christ, you mm -hmm. know, or any or Our Lady, the Virgin Mary. It's Mary or his mother. It, they're very simple, mm -hmm. and they're, they're, they read much, they're much more credible as a historical document, and that's because that those kinds of exaggerations happen later, not mm -hmm. during the lifetimes of people who actually witness the event. This is what I'm telling you is not my conclusion. This is how historians evaluate ancient writings. Mm. Now, the other th thing that they do to look at ancient writings to determine whether or not they're credible is whether or not what they describe matches what we know from other historical evidence. For example, the Gospels talk about the Pharisees or the scribes. What the Gospels say about them, does that match what we know from other writings about who the Pharisees were or what they believed? Yes, it does. It mm -hmm. mentions Pilate. Is there, was there a person named Pilate? Yes, there was. It mentions Caiaphas. Was there someone named Caiaphas? Yes, there was. So when you align all of these things, you can see from an objective historical standard that mm -hmm. the Gospels are reliable. And so if they are reliable in all these other ways, if a historian accepts them as a credible source of information, and they do, then why shouldn't we? And if mm. they're credible when it comes to the, the teachings of Jesus and Jewish behavior and beliefs in the first century and crucifixion procedures and things like this, why wouldn't they be credible about the resurrection? Right. Right. To take it back to our subject matter tonight, mm -hmm. which is the resurrection. So they're going to be truthful about that and then lie about the resurrection? Does that make sense? Re remembering that when these Gospels were written, there were still people alive who mm -hmm. remembered and experienced the risen Christ. The last person to be actually healed by Jesus died after Trajan, during the reign of Hadrian. That's after the year 117. That's mm. a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have this idea, Father, that because the, um, the lifespan of people, the average lifespan was like 40, mm -hmm. that nobody was alive at the time, if, even if the Gospels were written in the 60s or 70s, nobody was alive who could possibly remember this thing. Mm -hmm. And that's a crock. You know, mm -hmm. average lifespan takes into consideration infant mortality, women, young women dying right. in childbirth, which right, was really right. common, and things like this. But we know that there were many, many people who lived to old age, to the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, including the evangelist John, John including St. Right. Polycarp, who, who dies as a martyr at the age of 86, the Bishop Bothinos in the Church of Lyon in Vienne, who dies as a martyr, aged 88 or something like that. So a lot of people live to extreme old age. So this mm -hmm. idea that nobody could possibly be alive who remembered these things, this is a lot of nonsense. 
So how, so, I mean, like just going one step further with that, I mean, you know, it, many people are unwilling to consider the resurrection unless it can be proven uh, somehow scientifically or historically. How should we then respond to this kind of demand or expectation? Well, we have to look at the fact that God did not want to force us to accept him or believe in him. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we do live in this era when people want everything that they will only accept things that can be scientifically explained. But God is not a creature. God is outside of the universe, outside of the realm mm -hmm. of science, mm -hmm. beyond the realm of science. Science only deals with that which can be quantified, measured, examined. You can create an experiment and test your theory. You can't do that with the resurrection. Mm -hmm. This was a one-time event. You can't do that with the person of Jesus Christ. Certain things are subject to scientific inquiry and experimentation and evaluation, and other things are not. Historical events are not subject to scientific tests. Mm -hmm. Only mm. experiments are, you know, you can try to repeat an experiment to see whether or not you get the same results. History isn't subject to science. So we have to accept the fact that God chose a very sort of unbelievable math manner of death, like we were talking mm -hmm. about with the cross, to bring about the salvation of the world. Why? Why do that? Why wasn't mm -hmm. Jesus born as a king? Why didn't mm -hmm. he show himself to the Sanhedrin after he was resurrected? Why any of these things? Because mm -hmm. God respects our free will. And rather than giving us something that can be understood and proven scientifically or logically, he wants us to come to him through faith. That way, mm. it's our free choice. Mm -hmm. And I don't think most people think about it that way. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. want all of the strings wrapped up and everything presented to them in a, in a nice package so that they can logically accept everything. And this is what St. Paul is arguing against in 1 Corinthians when he talks about the cross. He mm -hmm. said the world did not come to know God through wisdom. So God did not choose to save the world through human wisdom, but to save people, save the world through the foolishness of what we preach. He saves mm -hmm. those who believe. Mm -hmm. So if everything about our faith was logical, and, and acceptable to the human mind, it would mm -hmm. not require faith, and we would have to believe. Right. And then also, of course, God wouldn't be no greater than our own mind. Mm -hmm. But God mm -hmm. wants us to come to him through faith, and this means that you have to make that leap. You have to be willing, at least, to consider it and Just, to be know, open to it. Mm -hmm. Like how he speaks about in the the book of Revelation, which says, I stand at the door and, you know, knock. just yeah. knock. Yeah. Father, I mean, that's a beautiful it, image, Father. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, you know, mm -hmm. when I tell people, because I, I understand that it, is, it isn't always easy to believe. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, Father, as a, a young person, I know that I struggled with doubts myself mm -hmm. for, for a long oh, yeah. time. Mm -hmm. You know, even, even as a presbytera, there were times when I would think, is this really possible? How is this even possible? Mm -hmm. This I, Because I'm a pretty logical thinker. Or being a mm -hmm. lawyer myself, I like proof. I, I'm a pretty logical thinker. And I had to struggle with that too. And so I say to people, you must at least be open. Don't shut the door. So mm -hmm. be open to it and ask God because God does answer our prayers. But he does want us to seek him, to search for him, mm -hmm. to want him, to mm -hmm. ask for him. So God is not going to prove himself. I knew somebody once who said, God has to prove himself to me. Really? God's going <laughs> to prove himself to you? Since, who are you to right, make right. that kind of demand? Well, that is never going to happen. Mm -hmm. But if we, in humility, recognize that God is God and we seek him and mm -hmm. we at least leave the door open to believe, then I think that eventually those doubts go away. But sometimes it just takes time, you know, especially Absolutely. when you're young. When you're mm -hmm. young, you don't have enough life experience. After you've been around for a while, then you exactly. kind of see the hand of God working in your life mm -hmm. if you're open to seeing that. Yeah. 
You're listening to Live with the Lows. We are speaking with our dear friend, um, Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. She's written a great book, everyone. I encourage you uh, to check out this book. It's called The Crucifixion of the King of Glory, The Amazing History and Profound Mystery of the Passion. I, by the way, I love that title, this, The Crucifixion of the King of Glory. Yes. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful topic, uh, a title. And I encourage all of you as you're listening to our show, definitely uh, check out this book. And we also invite you, you know, there's still some time before the end of our show. If you want to ask a question, uh, to Dr. Jeannie Constantino, call us at 1-855-237-2346, um, 1-855-237-2346. Uh, you can email us a question at ask at ancientfaith.com. As I mentioned to you earlier, just as a little side note, is um, we encourage you to stay connected to us all throughout the week through our social media platforms that are on, um, whether it be Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all under the headings of The Lowe's, that's L-O-U-H-S. And if you're interested in receiving our daily inspirational messages, go to thelows.com forward slash subscribe simply put in your email address and tomorrow morning at 7 a.m eastern time you're going to receive our word of encouragement for the day dr genie as we're continuing on you know what are some of the most common arguments people give against the resurrection of christ well i think um the first one that some some people give <clears throat> although this is the most ridiculous of all is that <laughs> jesus never died okay mm. So one of the arguments that they say, well, he only is this sometimes people call this the swoon theory that he swooned, that he mm. sort of passed out, but he never really died. First of all, we know that he was pierced in the side with a soldier's lance. There's there's no way that he didn't die. They checked. Mm. That's part mm. of the procedure of making sure that someone is dead. OK, mm. that was, by the way, done purposefully, and they were trained in how to do that. So the idea that Jesus could somehow survive the crucifixion, that's impossible. People did not survive crucifixion. They, do, they weren't sort of wounded. It was mm -hmm. such a—and and by the way, quite a few people were involved in burying him, not mm -hmm. just Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. They certainly had helpers, and the women were there. They, they didn't bury a live person. So the idea that Jesus never died. So this is one of the arguments that he never died, and they he they put him in the tomb, and he was still alive. And somehow he got out. He pushed the stone. These mm -hmm. stones are massive. They weigh hundreds of pounds, mm -hmm. and he had just been crucified. So he was extremely weak. This this idea that he could somehow wake up in the tomb and move the stone is the the most ridiculous argument of all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then of course we have the argument that the body was stolen by the disciples, which is what the the Jews said. That's why they asked Pilate to put a guard and seal the tomb and all of mm -hmm. this. They said the disciples are going to steal the body. Well, then you have to ask yourself, why? Mm -hmm. Why would they steal the body? And, of course, one of the arguments against that also is the fact that the grave cloths are left behind. That's one of the important details. Right. I, I was going to ask you to just speak a little bit about that. I think that's one of those sentences or verses in Scripture that people tend to overlook and read quickly. But maybe you can just maybe expand yes, a little well, bit on that. Remembering that he had... Um, had suffered innumerable wounds, I mean, far too many wounds that you could count, mm -hmm. and then he was wrapped in these cloths and maybe also a big shroud put over him, and he was tied up. Mm -hmm. They used to sort of tie them at the ankles and then sort of tie them around the waist. And so he, he has this shroud around him, and all of those, and, and of course they had put the different dry powders, the mirror mm -hmm. and aloes that Nicodemus brought, um, there's no way that uh, what it, so after the body was washed, the blood would continue to ooze out a little bit, and mm -hmm. those that linen cloth would have stuck to the wounds. Do, mm -hmm. Are you old enough, Father, to remember when band aids mm -hmm. used to stick to your wounds? Are you too young yes. for that? Uh, I think oh, I wish I was too young. I, I wish that was the case. <laughs> remember that uh, no, I when do, your mother absolutely. would want to take off the band aid to check yes. your little scab, yeah, and yes. when by taking it off, she ripped it off. So mm -hmm. th there's no way that anybody who was stealing the body would leave the grave cloths behind. First of all, mm -hmm. they'd be in a hurry. They would lift up the body and carry it with the cloth. There's no reason to leave the cloth behind, and it would have mm -hmm. been quite difficult to remove and very messy, let's not forget. Mm -hmm. So the idea of the body being stolen makes no sense, and especially by the disciples, because remember, what did they do? They went around the world after this saying that Jesus rose. So now we have to ask, if this is true that they stole the body and made up the resurrection, or some people will say that they imagined that he was alive or he was a ghost or 
they decided to just carry on for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is it that they were teaching? What did they preach? And we can see very easily in the epistles of Paul and in the books of A book of Acts what they were preaching. What they're preaching was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So why would they leave everything they knew, everything they loved, because they had homes, they mm -hmm. had families, and go exactly. around the world preaching something that never happened? Because mm -hmm. whenever they went out to give this message, they weren't greeted with red carpets and roses thrown at their feet. They weren't mm -hmm. given banquets. They were beaten and they were tortured, and they all of them died, except for John, a death mm -hmm. by torture. Mm -hmm. So this idea that somehow they would just make this up, and by the way, when we talk about apostles, we don't just mean 12. We're talking about hundreds of eyewitnesses mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the resurrected Jesus in the flesh, where they actually touched him, and they hugged right. him, and they looked at the wounds. This was a bodily resurrection that was witnessed by hundreds of people. So what do they have to gain? This is my question. Would you do that? I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't mm -hmm. leave everything and I knew and right. sac devote the rest of my life to something that I knew to be a complete fabrication. And by the way, it's not just three or 10 or 12, but hundreds, literally right. hundreds of eyewitnesses. And none of them recanted. Not one mm -hmm. person ever said, yeah, we kind of got together and decided to carry mm -hmm. on for Jesus. Mm -hmm. But carry on what? To carry on a lie. What's in it for them? There's nothing in it for them except mm -hmm. that they were motivated because they experienced something so profound they could never deny it. And they weren't afraid. And they went around the world. They didn't care what sacrifices, what hardships they endured. Mm -hmm. because it was true, and they were going to tell the rest of the world that death is not the end, that Jesus Christ has conquered death by mm -hmm. rising from the dead. So even though these things on one level seemed kind of logical, yeah, they made it up, they decided to carry on for Jesus, if you just think about it, just think mm -hmm. with your, uh, you ask yourself, would I have done that? Right. Is it right. possible that all hundreds of people would all agree to to I mean uh, you can always imagine a couple of people who are mentally unbalanced, but mm -hmm. you're talking about hundreds of witnesses. And, who and would the, do and that? The, right, and the and I think you I I, I, I oftentimes share that in, in in types of conversations when I'm having with people that may be inquiring who are maybe atheist or agnostic yes. and they're doubting yes. and questioning, and I I you know I share that what you were just sharing. I said that you know that not only you, do you have the fact that. You know, you have these people that it wasn't just a few people that saw him. That, that yes. the Bible, the Bible right. accounts hundreds of people that saw him. Yes. Um, and that he and, and Jesus wasn't the only person he resurrected. He resurrected other people that that you know from the from the dead. Most of, we just know of you know we know of Lazarus, the the widow's son. You know. Um, yes. So, but I guess the point I, I think what's so beautiful that you just shared, Doctor Jeannie, is how you know when you just simply just think. I mean, think. just think. I mean. First of all, women had no rights or privileges then. They were, yes. they were, you know, and and the fact that the gospel writers are intentional about putting how Mar Mary was, uh, uh, that the, the, the mm -hmm. message of the resurrection comes to the women first. They weren't even, they yes. had no rights. Then you add the fact that, as you beautifully just stated, how Christ, that these people did not just die a simple death, they died a horrific death. He's, I mean, mm -hmm. St. Paul talks about his five different occasions of, Yes. Experiencing all this. And, you know, he was married. I mean, you know, so it's like, you know, they, they had families, they they had careers, they yes, had, I'm sure, they, dreams and ambitions. They and put children, all of that and off. Sure. Yeah. And what would nothing mattered but that. Exactly. Yes. So what, what they saw and experienced must have been so transformational that they were like, you know what, I don't care what I'm going to endure. Yes, the right. world needs to know That's about right. this. That's and, right. That, and so it's just like, <clears throat> we've all had somebody that we love who died. And, you know, we all have experienced this idea that it just seems kind of unreal that this person, we're not going to see them again. We still think that at any minute they're going to come home, they're going to call mm, us on the phone mm -hmm, or something. Mm. Imagine if this is you and you know this is your this is your rabbi, you believe he's the Messiah and even the Son of God, and he has just died. And they were so traumatized and they were so devastated by that. And then they see him alive again. How? What kind of impact would that have mm. on you to mm. see him with the wound standing there and knowing that he was cold mm. and dead and buried? You mm. know, what 
how would that change you? Mm. This changes everything. Absolutely. And they were on fire after that. Mm. And nothing, nothing would stand in their way. No hardship, no difficulty, no trial would ever stand in the way. Yes, the world has to know the grave is not the end. There is a possibility of eternal life, and we've come to give you that message. So if you think of Christianity, Mm -hmm. of the Christian faith about being like, well, you're supposed to love one another, because this is what I imagine. People say, well, they decided to carry on for Jesus, the message of Jesus. So Mm. I say, okay, what's that message? They say, love one another. Well, you know what? That's not unique to the Christian faith. That's right. Okay. No. And when 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 the evangelists went out, when the apostles went out to preach, they said, well, they've, you've come to give us a message. What's the message? Love one another. Oh, well, mm-hmm. thank you very much. You can sit mm-hmm. down now. Mm-hmm. No, that's not what they preached. They preached that the Messiah has come. He's the Son of God, not just the Messiah, but the Lord himself, that mm-hmm. he was crucified, but he rose from the dead. And because of this, you too can have eternal life. Mm-hmm. That's the promise of the church. That's the message of, of the church. So on on Pentecost, right after they received the Holy Spirit, St. Peter gets up and goes out to the street, and everybody's hearing people speaking all these languages, mm. and he gets up and he preaches, and he says what? He says, this Jesus whom you crucified is not in the grave. We have David's tomb right over there. We have Abraham's mm. tomb. We have the prophet's tomb. They're still in the tomb. But Jesus, whom you crucified, he's speaking to the people of Jerusalem, mm. is alive, and we are his witnesses. That's what made the apostles important. Not that mm. they talked about love and other little beautiful things. Mm. Obviously, mm. love is a nice thing. That's not the essence of the Christian exactly message. Exactly right. It's yeah. not ethics. It's not about love. It's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And again and again and again, the apostles and the Lord himself said to the apostles, you are my witnesses. That's mm. why they're important. They were actual human beings who were witnesses of the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. So all of us who believe today are believing on the basis of their testimony. And mm-hmm. to me, it makes more sense that something like that really happened. So when I was you know, struggling myself with whether or not I believe and whether I, I can accept this, to me, it makes less sense that nothing happened. And that Mm. everything was invented, to me, that's very illogical. Something happened, and something profound happened, and it can only be this one thing. It's exactly what they said, that Mm -hmm. they saw him alive again, not once, not twice, not from a few people, but many, many times. Many more, there are many more um, events of the appearance of Christ that we don't know about. We only know about some of them, yeah. Exactly, and I think when we would talk about even as within the Gospel of John, the last sentence, I think, just speaks volumes to yes. all of us, you know, is that there's so much more that Jesus said and did that the, that the world itself couldn't even contain the books that were written, that, that if they were to be written. Right. I think it's so fascinating, Dr. Jeannie, when I when I hear your passion, and, you know, obviously, it's, it's oftentimes people say, you know, when they, whenever we're doing retreats or giving a sermon, they're saying, you know, Father, you know, that was a great message or whatever, but I always say, it's not my message, I'm just simply yes, sharing it. It's so. his It's exactly. his love story to the world, and you know, it's so beautiful because when you look at like, you know, uh, this Sunday I'm giving a sermon um, on uh, doing a sermon series uh, actually entitled From the Tomb to Today. And I just, I think about who Jesus Christ, who he visits after he rises from the dead. Yes. He visits Thomas. He visits Mary Magdalene, who's weeping. Yes. And he visits, you know, and he comes to Peter. Um, yes. And, you know, sometimes I think that and maybe you could speak a little bit to this in just the last few moments of our of our show is, you know, how co- how Christ always meets us where we're at. Yes. You know, he, he, I, I just I think that for yes. me that just speaks volumes about how I agree. amazingly uh, unbelievable loving our Savior is that He just yes. is just in yes. love with us so yes. much. He meets yes. you where you're at. Exactly, I love that too, and that that was sort of part of the lesson of of last Sunday, the you know, Sunday of St. Thomas. Mm-hmm. And I feel so bad for Thomas because forever he's known as the doubting Thomas. And mm-hmm. poor Thomas, you know, uh, yeah, he, he hadn't experienced it and he, he didn't feel like he could believe unless he had that 
experience of actually seeing and, and the wounds and touching Jesus. Mm-hmm. So he really felt like he needed that. And so when the Lord suddenly appears on the eighth day in front of him and Thomas is there and he says, come over here, Thomas, mm. and put your finger here. He mm-hmm. says it not disapprovingly. I think we imagine that he's scolding Thomas, but he's giving Thomas what he needs. He Mm. needs that to believe. That's why I said, if we feel like we're struggling with our faith, if we ask God to send us what we need, he always, to to strengthen our faith, he always responds because he wants us to be with him. He wants us to love him. And he knows that we are fallible and that we're weak. So he comes over here, Thomas, come over here, put your finger right here in the hole Mm. where the, put your hand right here in my side, you know, and it's so powerful. And it's really, it's really beautiful because he knows what Thomas needs. And the same thing with Mary Magdalene, as you mentioned, because Mm. one of the questions that arises with these various resurrection appearances is why is it that the Lord sometimes is instantly recognizable? Mm. Like all of a sudden he's in the upper room Mm-hmm. And they all see him and they're all startled and they think they might, you know, have be seeing a ghost. And other times, like in the case of Mary Magdalene, she doesn't recognize him right away. Mm-hmm. Or on the road to Emmaus, they don't. Mm-hmm. These are disciples of the Lord that don't recognize him right away. So the fathers of the church tell us that it depends upon what that person needs, mm-hmm. that he does not reveal He does not allow them to recognize him until they are ready to accept that and understand it. Mm. So the the Lord always gives us what we need, and it's different for every person. So this is one, one reason why we have to accept people, let people be in their space where they are, and sometimes not try to push people forward into something that maybe they're not really ready to understand or receive. I think that's so beautiful too, you know, because I think for as Christians, I mean, if there's any people that should get this right, it's us in the sense that, you know, how we, you know, I'm sure you you caught on to this uh, theme of joy, joy, yes, joy, joy yes. through the crucifixion. Yeah, and we say it through the rejoice, divine liturgy yeah. and rejoicing. And I think there's a joy that we have that, it, you know, um, I, I was sharing with our community that, that the resurrection was not just an event. It's it's an invitation. It's an invitation to transform Absolutely. our life. And yes. um, and so I hope that you know our listeners tonight, uh, hearing your beautiful words, uh, Dr. Jeannie, as always, um, will be inspired to, to say, okay, I've I've received this extraordinary gift. Now, right. now, what do I do with it? I mean, That's how do right. I go out and be an apostle like with that passion, That's with that right. fervor that Christ wants us to have? So, oh, I thank love you. that you said that, Father, because mm. I I just want because I, I know we're we're re- re- no go ahead please oh. yes um. When when we we read about we have the uh, on, on Holy Saturday morning the epistle reading because people used to be baptized on Holy Saturday the epistle reading is Romans six where Paul talks about dying and rising with Christ so mm. I was thinking a lot about that this year and the fact that we're supposed to die with Christ and rise with Christ we do that literally in our baptism when we go under the water. So mm-hmm. what happens every year? We go through Lent and we enjoy Pascha and we rejoice. And then we're not supposed to go back to our lives the way they mm-hmm. were before. We mm-hmm. should really be every year be transformed a little bit more to model mm-hmm. the image of Christ so mm-hmm. that otherwise it's just a cycle. We just go back to Lent and we start exactly. just where we were last year. We exactly. enjoy Pascha and then we forget about it. We go back to our lives as before. So I would really like to encourage all of us to really think about what it means that we were called to, and we have agreed, we have mm-hmm. all chosen to die with Christ so that we might live with him. And so that is the call of the resurrection as you mentioned, Father, the invitation, isn't Mm, it? Because if we don't die with him, we won't live with him. Mm, That's a beautiful way to end. Thank Dr. Jeannie, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. I know you're so busy and I just love you and all that you you do, what you what you write. Yeah, thank you. I encourage all of our listeners, friends, check out this book. It's The Crucifixion of the King of Glory, The Amazing History and Profound Mystery of the Passion. Uh, It's an amazing book. I we don't recommend a lot of books because we're very kind of particular. This is one you need to have in your library. It's an extraordinary book. And Dr. Jeannie is just an amazing person, a woman of faith. Um, and so, Dr. Jeannie, again, thanks so much. Thank to, you, Father. 
Oh, and, and uh, to Matushka Trudy, Jesus. who always to pr who produces the show today, um, and as she does every single week, we thank her. Yes. Next uh, next Tuesday, friends, we're going to have Carrie Kompakis. We're going to be talking. She's a well known author and um, on social on social media um, about motherhood. She's written numerous books on motherhood. Extraordinary person. Um, so you don't want to miss out on that show. It's next Tuesday, May tenth at eight p.m. Again, everyone, God bless you and stay strong in your walk of faith. Father Nick and Dr. Roxanne are the authors of the book, Renewing You, a priest, a psychologist, and a plan, which can be purchased at store.ancientfaith.com. Their daily inspirational messages can be found at thelows.com slash subscribe. Be sure also to search for The Lowe's on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Live with The Lowe's is a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio. St. Paula of Palestine was born in ancient Rome. Her family was very wealthy and she lived in great luxury. She married a man who was 